everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's Jackie. So guys, this week we wanted to talk about manding. Specifically, we wanted to talk about manding for information. And then we said, you know what we should do? Instead of just reading about manning for information, we should man for information from the person who did the research articles <laughs> about manning for information, Dr. Sarah Lachago, who is on the line with us right now. Sarah, how are Hi. you? Hi, good. How are you guys? We are doing very well. Great. Good. I'm drinking hot chocolate, so I'm really good. Oh, I'm that's drinking... nice. I wish it was cold enough here to justify <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. I'm drinking chai. It's totally oh. cold enough here. <laughs> Yeah. I'm drinking a Dr. Pepper, yeah. Yeah, girl. Ooh, yeah. Right, doing That's it the up. best soda. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the yeah. time to chat with us about this topic. Uh, you, you've written nicely on Manning for Information, and we are very Thanks. excited to hear that you would come and share all of this information with us. Um, yeah, absolutely. We're going to be discussing two articles. I'm just going to say what those are, and then we'll... We'll get into a more more formal introduction for you. So we're going to be talking about two of your articles. The first is from 2010 and was published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. And it was called Mans for Information Generalize Across Establishing Operations, which kind of sounds like it's, you know, like really exciting. Like everyone, Mans for Information Generalize Across Establishing Operations. You know what I like about that title what? is it's not just like maybe we'll talk about some things. It mm -hmm. actually tells you. Yeah. What yeah, happened? That's why I like the title. <laughs> that's precisely one of the reasons why we picked it. I'm not kidding. Yeah, I like that. Like you know what you're gonna get. <laughs> just say it. Yeah. But well, it kind of sounds like the it's like the headline of the of the newspaper. Yeah, it's like it this does. just in. Man's <laughs> information generalized. <gasps> I thought it was the communists. Oh no. <laughs> and you wrote that uh, with Car, Grow, Love, and Almason, and uh -huh. then. The sequel, I don't know if it was the sequel, but another in the series, Teaching How, Man for Information Frames to Children with Autism. And that's by you and Howell, Kakaval, and Peterson. And that was in the 2013 Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. We know you as the author of this article. Uh, listeners also might know you if they listened to it would have actually would have been our last episode, our live episode, where you came in as a secret special guest because you had some information to share about <laughs> autism at college. <laughs> Which was which was really cool. If you were not there, then you just hear a voice suddenly come in, which ooh, it's super cool. But but tell everyone if they didn't listen to that or they only heard you as just a, a you know a secret special guest on that one. Tell us all about yourself, just all about yourself. Everything. All about myself. Wow. Maybe I'll just start with where I studied. I had the privilege and the honor of doing my doctoral studies um, at Western Michigan University with Jim Carr. And of course, there I've got to work with and take a course from Jack Michael. That's and awesome. Jack was mm -hmm. one of, I know, right? So pretty inevitable that I was going to kind of fall into verbal behavior coming from my lab with like <laughs> people like Kyle McGill and Anna yeah. Peters' daughter and mm -hmm. Barbara. There's some pretty good folks, you know, a decent group. You could say that. And I was fortunate enough to actually have Jack Michael participate on my thesis committee. And I think one of the best parts of that was lots of, if, you, if your listeners don't know, Jack used to live in his basement. So there were a lot of late night or very early morning, depending on what he wanted, um, basement chats uh, over verbal behavior and motivating operations. And those are probably some of my fondest memories of grad school because how many people get to say they, they chatted in the basement with Jack over wine and chocolate, you know? No, uh, I've never, behavior. I've never heard that. I, so I, I like you know it. what? I, I did hear that. I heard that from Kyle. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> he used to tell uh, those stories. Just, <laughs> you know, it's just it's it's just a special universe down there, and and he helped me kind of flesh out some of my uh, my thesis, uh, which was at Man for Information Study, and that was actually my first attempt at writing a research study. That's how it started. Cool. All right. For a class. Well, you did a pretty good and job. And Tim goes, well, that's pretty good. You should <laughs> actually do this thing. And I said, all right, let me do this thing. The rest is history. And then I got my first academic position at Florida State University, where I got to work with Al Murphy and Grandpa John Bailey. And in 2010, I had the privilege of joining Dr. Jennifer Fritz and Dr. Dorothea Lerman here at the University of Houston Clear Lake where I have been since. We teach in the Behavior Analysis Program. See, we have clinics as part of our Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities. I am the founder and the director of the Verbal Behavior Clinic 
and I just started a telehealth leg of that clinic this past summer. And Dr. Fritz and I co-direct a program called Connecting the Dots, which is a grant-funded program in which we do caregiver training, in which we kind of teach parents how to address communication deficits and problem behavior, but also kind of helping them um, understand sometimes the relationship between those two things, hence kind of helping them connect the dots. Got it. Um, That's yeah. clever. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I didn't really connect those device. dots until you said it now. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't know what to name it. We were thinking, we were like, we were just had all these egg heck dork names, you know. And so we were pitching it to a colleague of ours. And we we're like, well, what do you think of this program? And he's like, that's great. You help parents connect the dots. And we're like, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, golly. Uh, that's great. And, that's a great um, name. Yeah, I, I think so. It's it's catchy. Um, and we have uh, been fortunate to have funding for this program since 2016. We get funded every year. So I'm just riding that wave. And we're so lucky to have the phenomenal students that we do. And I run a research lab and we run a variety of research. M- mine is mostly, you know, focused on verbal behavior. And that's just about it. So you're not busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's- I I know. I need to... <laughs> I need to step up. No, that that's awesome. You're doing a lot of really interesting, cool, fantastic stuff out there. I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's it's really nice when you get to work with um, productive colleagues who like to share and kind of share ideas and share space and resources. That that makes a big difference. So I'm really lucky out there, and we have such great students that are just so hungry and so much fun to work with. So nice, beautiful. Yeah. The idea for research and manding for information came from those, you know, the basement chats with, with Jack Michael. Well, or, or partially, the, at least. The, he helped me. So mm-hmm. he came after I already dreamt up the idea. Oh, okay. Well, so how, how did you dream up this the idea? This was a Sarah production. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it was sort of – it was inspired by – some early days of training. Um, so before uh, I started grad school, I worked on a research site, which I'm not going to name, but we were doing some programs, um, and this is before I, I met any behavior analysts, but we, we did a program called Conversations. And I remember it kind of went uh, like this. So I would say something like, uh, my favorite food is hamburgers. What's yours? And then the child would have to say, uh, my favorite food is spaghetti. And then he would say, my favorite color is blue. Uh, what's your favorite color? And then I would say, oh, my favorite color is red. And then I'd say, well, my favorite sport is soccer. What's yours? And he'd say, oh, my favorite. Do you get it? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And then you I'd check it. it off. Check, check, check. Right. And he mastered conversations. And I remember, thinking that. Back, <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking back then, he does not give a crap about any of those things he's asking. Like, I know, you know, he's a smart kid. I, I was like, he, he memorized a script. I said, but he's not really, not really asking me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I cut to a few years later. I get to grad school. I start learning about VB in my, my phenomenal lab filled with awesome VBers. And I'm learning a little bit about MOs. And then here was my opportunity to write a study. And uh, I wanted to explore uh, manding for information and how to develop MOs, right, Mm -hmm. Uh, that were sort of relevant to the man for information and how you make information relevant to individuals with autism, which is can be quite a challenge oftentimes. And I specifically examined generalization across establishing operations because a lot of folks clinically were teaching a man for an item under one EO, and I think assuming generalization across different EOs. So it just there was an empirical need. I'm sure. not sure if that's really the case. So that's what you do, you train just, mm-hmm. and hope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> train and hope. And, it, and I said, well, I don't know. If that's a great idea. And so we discovered that you know in that study uh, that it did work, but I'm not sure that's the case necessarily. Uh, for all right. learners or for all man's information. Yeah. So, so, Sarah, I'm going to have you take a step back here for our listeners. Yeah. And can you give us kind of an overview of what a man is and what establishing operations are? Of course. So I'll give the brief overview so we can get to the studies. Or right. you want me to go back to like 1950s Keller and so and so? No, we're pistols. okay. No, 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 that's, no, that's okay. fine. It's brief. <laughs> it's, I get so excited talking about EOs. I'm like, how in depth? What's brief to you? <laughs> All right. So a man is a verbal operant, right? Under the primary 
control, our primary influence of a motivating operation, and which specifies its reinforcer. And I and I emphasize primary because there is it is also influenced by the SD. Mm-hmm. And I and I say that because sometimes I review a lot of papers on man's and man's for information and sometimes um, people there's a sort of false dichotomy. Oh no, 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 there is an SD influence there. It's like, well that that's actually okay. Right. That's fine. Yeah. They're friends, I always say. They work <laughs> together. <laughs> But I also, but the primary influence, yes, has to be some sort of relevant motivating operation. And the motivating operation, as we call it now, in its early days, it was the establishing operation, but Poli and colleagues wrote a paper where they fleshed out a little bit our our terminology and introduced uh, the motivating operation. And it has two primary influences, if you will, right? It, It has a value altering effect. To primary effects. It has a value altering effect um, in that it alters, it can either establish or abolish the reinforcing or punishing value of a given stimulus, and that it has a behavior altering effect in that it can increase or evoke or abate behavior classes related to those consequences. Mm. I love those two words, evoke or abate. Which ones? Evoke, evoke or abate. abate. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I so uh, most them. people think of it, I always like to say reinforcing and punishing. Punishers do matter. But I think most of the time when people think about or talk about MOs, uh, they, they talk about it in terms of reinforcers. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. And with that's you. usually how we talk about it in terms of um, in talking about the man for information, the, at least these papers. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. So when you're talking about motivating operations in relation to manning for information, because I know for some folks, the, the the MO term becomes very vague and it's hard to sort of conceptualize what is kind of being talked about, you know, for real in the environment. So what are you looking at when you're talking about the man for information? Where Where is where is that MO? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. <laughs> it's on that's the right. shelf, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> it's that's in you and I'm in me and it was there all along. I myself <laughs> when I plan to teach it. Where, where the heck is the MO? <laughs> so... <laughs> One of the things that I think about is, one, how do I tie or how do I associate information to an established reinforcer? So it's that connection that kind of makes it meaningful. Mm -hmm. In other words, information serves to get you something that is established as a preferred or a reinforcer. And sometimes I draw inspiration from reality. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) there are different ways to contrive the, the motivating operation. The transitive condition motivating operation is one way, and, and it's, a, it's a really useful way to do that. You know, one item is associated with an established reinforcer, thereby kind of establishing that item as a reinforcer. So let's say you're food deprived, your favorite food is spaghetti, I give you a bowl of spaghetti, that establishes a fork as a reinforcer. So now that fork's missing information about that fork becomes a reinforcer. Mm-hmm. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. It does. I love forks. Yeah, like that. <laughs> Precisely for that reason. Because you have this yeah. long history of forks. I love Paschetti. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, so it's a CMOT. You know, one of the first things I think about, especially as it pertains to individuals on the autism spectrum, is how do I connect information to an established reinforcer? In other words, how do I make it so that you, they need that information to gain access to a reinforcer? We're not so far off from the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I, you know, read information to gain access to um, putting, you know, an instruction manual, putting something together to successfully kind of build my my nightstand mm. or whatever. From Ikea. Be, right. Mm. I get information to get access to my final destination, uh, which is a restaurant, for yeah. example. Yeah. Something like, like my that. kids ask me, where is their sweatshirt? Multiple times a day. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I exactly, don't know. Right? Wherever you put it. <laughs> wherever yeah, you left it. it. I don't know how useful. (laughs) Right. But that information is useful, right? Because then it it gains them access to a needed item or the reinforcer. So let me just tell you one quick anecdote that's way off topic. But my (laughs) three-year-old, he's like constantly losing whatever toy he's holding. And he'll come up to me and he'll be like, where's my Jake and the Neverland pirate? I'm like, I don't know where it is. Where did you last have it? He goes, well, it was in my hand (laughs) and now it's gone. (laughs) And he's holding it? No, he lost it. But that was the last oh, place I he thought saw you were it. saying he was still holding it. And I was like, Whoa. It, it, it was in my hand, and now 
It's gone. <laughs> His favorite toys are very, very small, and he wants to sleep with them, which means that invariably they've been knocked somewhere yeah, in the middle exactly. of the night. So it's, it's always a fun game. But anyway, really so I'm not helping the situation because I don't have the reinforcer available when they manned for that exactly. information. So I don't know where they put their stuff. Yeah, I can't keep Exactly. That stuff. information is may not function as a reinforcer. No. But you find, you must know. find enough things just on such a, on a such a weird schedule. intermittent schedule that they <laughs> just a schedule, keep sure, asking. sure. That maintains, sure. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's right. And and I think for certain types of man's for information, it's it's certainly easier to contrive like where or who has. Recently, we're about to submit this. We started tackling um, why. Ooh, That's oh. a whole other. Ooh. We're getting the insight. <laughs> it gets scoop. trickier. Yeah. But mm-hmm. for, for these for these initial studies, you were sort of building off of some previous research, looking at just some some basic man's asking for information, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, Sunberg, Lil Pale, and Eigen here did. Um, their their study was really important to the man for information literature because I think it was the first where the where the animal was front and center were asking as the primary independent variable, and it, you can see if you, if you read that study, they examined who and where as well. Mm. And so uh, we just said, okay, those I said, well, those are cool mans. Let me use those. Yeah. Uh, but let's examine this effect with respect to generalization across establishing operations. Great. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, for one, love your behavior chains that you targeted in both <sighs> studies, but particularly the ones in 2010 article. How did you come up with them? Let's see. Let's see if I can actually remember. I can tell you. There's a volcano chain. There's volcano. always yeah. a volcano chain. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes I remember the first time I met Hank Brown. He's like, volcano chain. I was like, there you go. That's how I want to be known in the field. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. That's fine by me. I, I do a few things. I'll, I'll ask parents, you know, what kind of activities does he or she like? I may observe them play because I wanted to use an interrupted behavior chain procedure. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to use something that produced sort of like a, a pleasing outcome uh, for them. So um, and then I would just try some stuff. So I think part of it was in the lab. I asked people, like, do you have any ideas? Some people like, oh, science experiments for kids card tricks for kids so then i saw volcano and i thought well that looks cool and you know i individualize it you know the spoon doll uh, only one of my participants really like playing pretend so mm-hmm, i okay. use that with him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i wondered about yeah. that if it really was going to function as a reinforcer to complete the chain right mm-hmm. and it would certainly sure. depend on each student I, yeah. so i had to i had to test that with with each child okay yeah i mean i think maybe you know, in future studies, it may be practical, or at least in practice, uh, just just quickly assess whether these things actually function as reinforcers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's things that I look at throughout the study. So well, one of them, just anecdotally, is um, do they man for it? Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, yeah. Do they do they they man for the activity? And I yeah. thought it was really smart. I think it's in the 2013 one where you included mm-hmm. uh, sessions where they experienced the entire chain. Not contingently, mm-hmm. right? So I actually did that in both studies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, and I actually, this is something that I talk about in practice. It's critical for practice. Yeah. And so there's there's a few reasons I, I, I recommend doing that where you intersperse with if it's a, a where and you're using activity chains, give them, provide them all of the items. Mm-hmm. And so what that does is, one, it helps you at least monitor that the response is occurring under the appropriate influence of the rel- of the of the MO, right? right? So if you have all the items you need and you're hanging on to the spoon and you grab it and you look at it and say, where's spoon? Then we have a problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, it doesn't prevent that, right? What it does is it allows me to know as a researcher or clinician, oops, okay, we, we messed up somewhere and that's good because mm-hmm. you want to catch something like that as soon as possible go back to the drawing board and maybe introduce a new activity and kind of reassess how you're teaching. That's why I always say, for example, uh, allow them to contact the struggle. So if it's trying to find something, makes let them look a little, right? Mm-hmm. Don't just get to that point and just immediately prompt a response. Let them sort of experience the conditions under which one, someone would ask, where is this? Mm. Yeah, I like Precisely, that. because otherwise the, the MO... Is exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. and you can't That's expect exactly the behavior right. to maintain or generalize to other conditions right. if you haven't experienced it under the right That's conditions exactly. at first. You got it. 
So, I mean, you know, and that's the thing. So even if the item's missing, you know, I tell people, don't get enthusiastic. They have to experience the missingness because <laughs> it's the missingness of something that you need, right? It's the, wait, what? Look here, look there. Um, and then I get the longing eyes. Yeah, and then, I And then I come in. <laughs> uh, and so, then another reason is during baseline, I think it's important throughout, especially during baseline, where trials, if you don't get it right, just sort of end, mm-hmm. you know, and, the, you know, I'd have right. the child look at me and say, help, and then I'll just shut it down like the icy yeah. experimenter I am. <laughs> You're so icy. I was. And he would start to say, he started saying, uh, this one really cute kid, and it was during the house study, he would say, oh, well, maybe <laughs> next time. Oh. And all the undergraduate research assistants that were helping, they're like, oh, I said, calm down, he's good. He's all right. He's all right. But I do intersperse with completed chains from time to time so that presentation of the materials themselves don't become an abolishing operation. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So here so you some... don't want them to oh, you don't want to be loosey to their to their Charlie Brown kick in the football kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's so true. So here are mm-hmm. some examples of chains that you had used. You use a volcano chain where you actually mm-hmm. make a volcano and it erupts. Uh, you yeah. need strawberry milk. Uh, so or you, chocolate milk. Or chocolate milk. Uh, this is the 2010 said, list, right? The 2010 okay. list, yep. Yeah. So we're setting the table and there's some food at the end. Uh, mm-hmm. Doing a puzzle, uh, getting some ice cream. Uh, that's amazing. Playing with a truck and winning the doll for one participant. So just so our listeners kind of know the kind of fun behavior chains that you used. Yeah. So what what were you taking data on specifically? Uh, in that 2010 study? Yeah, in the 2010 study. Well, there were a few things that I wanted to examine. So, one, pretty obvious, are they manding? When... <laughs> Phew. <laughs> manding, yes or no, which is, that's why it's sort of a cumulative, uh, I used a sort of a cumulative assessment, because it's kind of a yes or no question. Did you or did you not do it mm-hmm. when the time was right? And making sure in my control chains that there was no manding. Mm-hmm. And then I also monitored whether or not they completed the chain. Mm -hmm. And that's something else that I recommend clinically if you're going to use um, activities or really anything. um, Is the information useful? Then do they do something with it? Because that's equally important. You use information that you get. Um, It also gave me a clue about whether the MO was there. So if you say, okay, where's Spoon? And I say, oh, it's in the yellow drawer. And then they go get it, and they just sort of sit down and stare at me, and they don't finish the chain. Um, that tells me something, mm-hmm. right? Right. That tells me well, I have a waning mo, mm-hmm. and that's that's something where I would try a couple times, and if I saw that, I would I would just cut that loose and, and do something else. Yeah. If I was looking at this clinically, because then I have a kid who doesn't really care, if you will, right? There's no mm-hmm. mo to complete the chain and do whatever it is at the end, you know. Yeah, I, I was surprised, you know, how many how many sessions you had to run, and I think in the 2010 versus the 2013, just you had fewer chains, you know. And some of those, just, man, how many times could they watch that volcano explode before it was they just really like, like oh, it. I don't care I'm where sure. the baking soda is, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> so you you make a good point uh, when you say so. They love it. I think the volcano chain is a winner. I tell people <laughs> always use it. I also used a tornado. Yeah. Oh, the tornado tubes. Um, Yep. Yeah. Those I can do little, forever. Uh, yeah. The <laughs> bottles. Those were in 2013 just... article. Yeah. Yeah. Right. With a connector. Mm-hmm. Um, did you use like that. Monopoly houses? We did. Okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. So they would see me, you know, a few, couple times a week. So this wasn't every day. Mm-hmm. So I think there was some novelty to it. I'm fun. I keep it fun. <laughs> I always tell people, remember, you're also playing, so don't be weird and severe about it either. Yeah. <laughs> right? Be Play. You know, I think some people sometimes get in their head, it's here's a trial. And they, okay, maybe volcano. And it's all weird and intense. Mm-hmm. And it's just like play, right? Like create, create an atmosphere that you would with any other kid. Play should be fun. That's partly what kind of, um, and in learning experience, that, that's what keeps kids going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so I say, you know, hey, ooh, are you ready? You want to make a volcano? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. You know, and I make sure that they're nice and enticed. Sometimes they even do one in front of their face. Oh, you want that? Okay, then you do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I get them all riled up for it. But I also know, and this is important, I think, for clinical practice, I keep an eye on the kid. And if they start to kind of drag a little 
or I see like, okay, that's cool. I watched it and it kind of turned away a little faster. Uh, end it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. End it. It's they're they're done with it for the day. They they liked it the next time they saw me, but but you make a great point. It pay attention to your learner. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe f- maybe they're in it for five trials, ten trials. Maybe it's two times today, and then that's all she wrote. Nice. So after you conducted baseline, you started your man for information training. So what yeah. did that look like? And how is it different from baseline? So in baseline, uh, they would get to the point in which the item would be, are we talking 2010 study? Yeah, yeah. still 2010. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they'd get to the point in the chain in which they would have to man for the location of the spoon. And if they would have manned it, I would have provided information. In all manning studies, you provide the reinforcer and baseline mm. if they manned. So I would have provided yeah. information, but they didn't. Mm-hmm. And so I would just let them look for it for a few seconds. And usually they just sort of look at me or sometimes say, help. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then I would just put everything away. <laughs> That's like soul crushing, by the way. It was like, a little like... bit. I mean, I wasn't overly mean or dramatic no. about it. <laughs> I was just very, okay, you know. I guess we're not and having then, ice cream ne- today. <laughs> <laughs> right. But maybe in a couple trials, you yeah. will. Remember interspersing, interspersing. Right. That's true. I mean, that's why that becomes really important because exactly right. I think after a few trials of denial, they would be like, you know what? Nah, not interested in you. Mm-hmm. And then during treatment, uh, the difference is when we reach that point, I'd allow them to, to look and then immediately provide and then provide the echoic prompt. Right? Mm-hmm. So, and did say, you say the word the say? Because in, in the 2013 article, you said say, say. Well, you would say the experimenter. Sorry, this is like yeah. so confusing. I think, ex- I, did, I think we did say, say, where's the spoon? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know because I know I forget the details. I know. Yeah. I to look real quick. Uh, no, you, yeah. I think you did, and I and I was just wondering because yes, there are some people that are like, don't say say, but do say uh, say. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, it, I it think depends it depends on the, on the history. Yeah, of the I, exactly. Yeah. I would right. think, and these kids all right. had had you know pretty decent tech man repertoires already. Right. So I'm guessing they they've already did. been around the bend in terms of like various people have prompted me right. to say a couple of these things. Yeah. And well, and they have to have certain things, right? They have to be able to tack all the items that are part of the chain. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. They have to be able to, they have to have a reasonably robust manning repertoire. Although one of them didn't have extensive, extensive mans. And that's where we talked a little bit about maybe we can intervene with mans for information sooner than we think. Mm-hmm. They have to be able to follow directions. If I'm going to tell you to go somewhere or do something as yeah. part of your information, then you have to be able to do it, mm-hmm. right? It has to properly control responding. So there's certain things that have to be in place before you before you target manding for information. Mm-hmm. Cool. And so then they would they would repeat it, and then I'd give them the information. They were so jazzed about that. They were like, "Yes, they were jazzed. <laughs> they surely were." And, uh, and I think for me, my pièce de résistance, my favorite part of that first study. And simply because it garnered a lot of praise from Jack Michael. So, honey, oh. oh, how's that? I know. It feels good. <laughs> <laughs> it does. You know, is uh, the control chain. Mm-hmm. And I tell people, like, that's all, almost one of the most important parts of training. Right. Is you have to have a control chain. In other words, some kind of activity on which they would not have reason or motivation, there would be no MO present to emit demand for information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, for the reasons I stated earlier, just to continue to monitor and ensure that responding is occurring under the, under the relevant motivating operation. Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. it's no good to teach them that, oh, an adult is present. I'll just start saying where, where, (laughs) where, who, who. That was the very first thing actually that inspired, uh, that inspired the thought. It should, in fact, I didn't have a control chain when I first presented it and all the professors are like, this is good. And I remember sitting in, in my lab thinking exactly that. Wait a minute. You know, we have, these kids have this really robust history of instructional control. Yeah. Like, what if it's just the fact that I'm here? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you to ask me. So there's a lot of things that you're controlling for when, when you introduce that control chain. So that's, that's exactly the, the thing that first went through my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so, so smart, Sarah. <laughs> oh. oh, I remember I brought it up to Jim and Jim's like, all right. Yeah. Good <laughs> talk. Cool. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so the, for one participant, the puzzle was a control chain, meaning they just had to get the puzzle out and do it. And then the other two, the truck. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it was that puzzle kid that sent me into almost a cardiac arrest during the control tube, though. (laughs) Because it was a high probability that he could have asked for a piece. He, He. No. 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 He has. He demanded where a spoon. Yeah. Right. Oh no. Yeah. Well, hold on. Hold on now. That was that was one of my. That was kind of to me after I got over the panic. One of the most interesting parts of the paper, and that's how I started to kind of relate it to men's for information or also function as autoclitic creams. So he. So we have that control chain. So I'm asking you now. They'd have to man for a different item. Mm-hmm. Right, and he I did this thing that. where he the, the the puzzle piece was shaped like a four, and yeah. so he the first trial he goes where's the spoon and my heart just God, right and yeah, yeah. Goes, and then he goes four four which was great because mm. it's like great yes okay now you get it All right, yeah relevant mo so what happened or the way I sort of interpreted it is where is the spoon sort of functionally became. Where is the yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and so for him multiple exemplar instruction across items might become important mm-hmm. that's why it says depends on the learner because of un- sort of understanding when you think about man's for information those frames I'm I'm a frame fanatic so I talk a lot about frames I always talk a lot about frames <laughs> so the frame where is the or who has the those are those are also autocritic frames. And that they have this sort of unitary function mm-hmm. that you learn how to say where is the under uh, conditions under which you need or want something that is not available to you. And you do that a few times. Usually in the natural environment, if you think about typically developing kids, they, they experience this many times. And those situations come to influence the mission of that response, where is the. And then that specific item is the tact the specific item that you need is the tack that's sort of inserted into the frame, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that's why for some learners, and especially for certain kinds of master information, multiple exemplar instruction across different items will become important as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for that single participant during post-training, he did ask where's four. He did. But Mm -hmm. did not ask for where's spoon, right? Mm -hmm. So that's nice. He didn't. No, he got it. Yeah, he did. And it appears that all of your learners in this study – both increased their man's falling training and asked the appropriate where a spoon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, where a spoon, and then the, the other, and they all got the the control. Who has the truck? Mm-hmm. Or where's or where's the truck? Mm-hmm, and then who has the? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so we've got all these great results, and before we continue on with the next phase of these experiments, I wanted to stop for a moment and do one of our secret code words. ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. So by listening and by getting the two secret code words hidden in this episode, you are able to get continuing education credits. You can just go to our website, abainsidetrack.com and get CEUs. So the first of those secret code words is gecko, G-E-C-K-O, like a gecko gecko. Or just a regular old gecko you'd I see just like geckos, in a okay. swamp or not even a swamp, just on the ground. Pfft, a gecko. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take a quick break and then come back with a little bit more about some of these fun man frames. We'll be right back. CBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. 
Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there! Okay, and we are back. So, we've been talking about some initial manning for information across MOs, uh, or generalizing across MOs. So, we had, what do we have so far? We had, we had where, we had who, we had where is, who, who has, or who. So, that was our, their, your 2010 study. And so, Sarah, how did the results from the 2010 study lead you to think about the 2013 study? Yeah. <laughs> It did. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, did it? I mean, <laughs> I'm always thinking about, or I think a lot about man's information, and that probably sounds weird to most people, but I just like them mm-hmm. because it's they're ubiquitous. We do it so much, mm-hmm. um, so it's just such a fundamentally important repertoire, and it has a relatively small research uh, base, although there is an uptick in popularity in man's information research, which I think is great and a lot of fun to see so yeah um, i think you you get tired of teaching the kids to ask for cookies and ask for help and ask to be all done and and then where mm -hmm. do you go from there well more interesting stuff (laughs) like information yeah i mean you know man teaching man you know it's extremely obviously extremely important um we know that it's something that we should target first when working with people especially with people with disabilities for the unique benefits it brings but I think I kept on thinking about those frames and the importance of sort of understanding them as autocolytic frames and the value of teaching the frames. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit what inspired how. Um, How is a little bit more challenging to teach. You definitely have to, in a very practical sense, you have to pull together a lot of change because once they learn, now the ammo is gone. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yep. (laughs) I thought that too. Yeah. And and that's fine. I mean, I, I think that's okay. I want to, again, monitor to see how they actually use the information. So I picked stuff that was interesting to my learners but was complex enough. Mm-hmm. Had lots and lots and lots of steps. Uh, yeah. So magic tricks become really good. Uh, origami <laughs> Uh, really good. The volcano I, um, made a return. I did, yeah, the, I did also write fun by the behavior chains because it... it Which, it was fun. It's it was like, like a page and a half. No, it was not sorry. No, it was, it was like uh, almost a almost like a, a full page or a full column of just and then the, this chain and then this yeah. chain and I used the this yeah. chain and the this chain. It sounded it was like an arts and crafts store. Like you raided a Michaels <laughs> and been like, here we go. How many chains can oh, we yeah. make with all this crap? All of these sound <laughs> so fun. Like the. Do you want to read them out, Jackie? Yeah, I want to read okay. them out. So there's the volcano chain, the tornado chain, the insect mm. chain, the movie oh, yeah. chain, the vending machine chain. The birthday oh, yeah. cake chain, the yeah. blocks chain, the music chain, the play setting chain. Not as fun, but that's okay. The jacks chain, the oh, jacket yeah. chain, the <laughs> chocolate milk chain, the popsicle art chain, oh, the magic yeah. trick chain, <laughs> the origami train, the lacing chain. Not as fun, but that's okay. You had to have some non-fun ones in there. But yeah, that's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. We had to get a lot of chains in there because you need your teaching chains, mm-hmm. your control chains, and then your your follow up, yeah, uh, maintenance chains. Mm-hmm. So you have to, you know. And the thing is, is as they learn, those chains become sort of useless in that sense. They can be good control chains as they learn how to complete the chains, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and right. in fact, they can move over. <laughs> and in fact, actually, I would do that. Exactly that. Yeah. With the same smart. chain, if you get the chance. That's smart. Because I want to ensure that way we can really regulate. There's nothing about the items related to the chain that's influencing the response, but rather, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right, the not knowing, if you will. Yeah. You only ask how on the volcano that first time when you need the baking soda and the vinegar. Then the next time you get that stuff, you, yeah. you're not going to ask how while you're dumping it in. Or if you, if you did, that's then exactly. okay. Right. Then and, it's, you know, yeah. and, that's, and we know now, uh-oh, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's kind of yeah. rectify that. So I wanted to examine two chains, the how do I and how many. Which I love uh, because, because I love that. I love that you added those two because the previous literature only said how 
And that would be weird if someone was walking around saying how to the so, listener. Yeah. 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 We actually started that at the same time that came out. Mm-hmm. Oh. And it's it's funny because if you're one of the few people, it's, you know, this is one of the things we review for journals. You're, and, and you're like part of a small family of researchers that does the same thing. And you're like starting a study and then you get to review a study that's yeah. like looking at the same thing. You're like, oh, Uh-oh. man. <laughs> okay. What is the ethicality like? Do I like, <laughs> right. can I fairly... But yeah, so, uh, you know, um, Alice Schillingsberg and her colleagues did this, you know, it was a great study. It was, they looked at just how in the absence of the full frame. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it was one participant. I think it was an older participant. And so it was, it was was a really neat study. But one of the things that I thought about was, but in the absence of the full frame, now we have a really narrow receptive pool of listeners Mm -hmm. who are likely to reinforce the response. The frames do become important because remember those frames are sort of these features of the environment that are influenced by uh, certain aspects of not knowing how or the missingness of something. And so we addressed that. We decided, you know, full frames for two kinds of how. And this is where I just kind of got a little experimental. I said, let's just teach how do I. Mm-hmm. And then we would we would teach under one how do I condition. Then probe for the, uh, you know, under the two other how do I's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a little follow up, little mm-hmm. maintenance that we still have. How do I? But then I also wanted to probe to see what would happen, what they would say, just for kicks under the how, how many. Mm-hmm. Right. I like that. that I, I wouldn't imagine that would come. So, And it didn't, but yeah. what I wanted to do, it was to kind of add to the conversation regarding man frames as autoclitic frames. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes and sense. And so when we probed, like when I said, okay, well, we can have a birthday party for uh, my friend Greg and uh, eat this cake, but it's, first you have to give me the right number of candles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me. And he said, how do I make a birthday party? I love mm-hmm. that. Right. I know. And I said, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it's sort of like an unprogrammed replication. I don't know how to do something. In those conditions, I've learned how do I. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was, just, it was just sort of neat to see. And, of course, once we trained the how many, um, he got those. And I think mm-hmm. we saw some generalization across mm-hmm. establishing operations for both those frames as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to yeah. I'm going to have you step back again too just for our our student listeners. Do you want to real quickly review what an autoclitic is for them? Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> just briefly like the I'll briefest do it, I'll of brief. Cuz you know that's that's a funky that's a I funky know. DB chapter. That's a tough one. It is a real I, tough I, I one. I like to can I explain it the way I like to do it? So you've got your you got your mans and your tax and your interverbals. And then, uh, you know, you got your coics and then it, it's ones with the writing. Don't worry about those right now. And then everything else is kind of autoclitic, maybe sort of. Don't worry about it. No one's going to no one's gonna quiz you on this after this class. That's no how I usually will. explain it when people ask me about it. <laughs> There's some truth to that. I remember talking to Jack. Um, I remember after the autoclitic chapter uh, when I was taking VB with the amazing Cindy Petrus. And it actually became one of my most favorite chapters. I did my VB research study on autoclitics actually um, and then dave palmer super got me into autoclitics because he's like the autoclitic guy he does the um, autoclitics <laughs> he does and so he and i talked a lot about auto- he was the one who encouraged me and kind of taught me to start thinking about the man for information frames as autoclitics because mm-hmm. i was presenting actually my thesis to my lab just as practice when i was practicing in front of amanda karsten actually uh-huh. um, jack michael and dave palmer just walked in and jack goes oh i like mans and then they just sat down oh so I just that's kept not going. intimidating <laughs> i kept going and Amanda goes good job good job just right through it you didn't even you didn't even flinch you just kept right going <laughs> but, but inside, it was so much fun <laughs> that's when i first met dave and we actually had uh you know a lot of conversations thereafter about autoclitics autoclitics is secondary verbal behavior right um, that engenders, right, the sort of descriptive of the primary verbal operates that sort of engender more specific or precise listening on a part of your listener. Oh, that's a nice. That's definition. That was perfect. Mm-hmm. I liked that. <laughs> so that's that's how we think about it, right? So they talk about it, it's relational, so it's not a primary operant, right? Um, yep. So, for example, like, 
I want the cookie. I, thought, I want the, it's not the man, the cookie is the man's part. Now I want, it's, it's kind of how the way we talk about grammar, it's the way we kind of identify differential sort of, there's many different kinds of autocritics, so sort of differential sources of control over responding. I see, I want, I heard, right? These yeah. kind of explain to the listener or communicate to the listener sources of control over your responding. Mm -hmm. That that produces a more sort of precise response on the part of the listener. I love and that. And there's this descriptive, different kinds of like qualifying, quantifying, descriptive, stuff like that. And so that's basically what autoclitics are. And, and that, the thing is, is, you know, I went to Jack and kind of talked about when I submitted my thesis, the, the person handling uh, my thesis, um, the, the 2010 study said, take out all the talk, uh, the autoclitic talk <laughs> in the dis this discussion. I don't see why it's included here. I don't think that a lot of people get are fortunate to get the kind of awesome verbal behavior education that we got at Western with mm -hmm. someone like yeah. Jack. Oh, that's so true. It's just such a precise learning history that we have over there, and it's it's quite unique, and I feel just really fortunate. And so I just kind of continue to keep on talking about it so that people don't feel like it's such a weird or foreign concept. It's just kind of how we account for lots of part of our grammar. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for that little that little off track. But I thought <laughs> that would be helpful since since a lot of our listeners are students. Uh, Jackie, I mean, let's let's and be me. honest. A lot of our listeners don't use the term autoclitic <laughs> very often in their practice. I'm sure they don't mind having. I don't think most reviewed. people do. No, yeah, exactly. They don't. <laughs> Actually, I don't. I don't think most people do. Wow. No. That's I mean, okay. I, I That's think especially the, you know, when, dive there. yeah, but when, if you're if you're working and, and you're working with folks who are, who are just purely clinicians, just purely practicing, you might not even hear anything beyond man tactic hoic half right. the time. Yeah. So well, hopefully if you're getting, there's a verbal somewhere in there. I mean, hopefully. I mean, they, they probably just do it as like, oh, you know, questions, fill questions, fill-ins. Oh. Not, not oh. to overgeneralize. Like you, you said that, oh. <laughs> You know, I think a lot of practitioners are teaching autoclitics and they just don't realize. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. I, I'm sure they don't just yeah. go, they teach everyone cookie and then they're like, well, we did it, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're the best. But the thing is, I think it's important to understand like what it is and why it's important. And I think you, you know, I mean, I can't overstate enough. You understand the underlying principles and you are better at what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think speaking to the the precision, you know, how how that adds to the precision of the man, I mm -hmm. I like that as as kind of its own little conceptual frame of like, okay, now I kind of understand the purpose of it as opposed to just like, oh, it's just other words, which doesn't really exactly, yeah, exactly, that's exactly right, and it and it's relational. It's like how how what. Right, that's why I have such furious also opposition to just teaching more as a man. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> oh yeah that can More be like what? a whole show in and of yeah. itself right mm -hmm. yeah i think that's what inspired that was part of the inspiration for the how and we just wanted to go for it and try it out so we did and we had a lot of fun and it was fun this time because this time i was the supervisor yeah that's always <laughs> nice and it's always cool when you get to to you know you know, be the supervisor and the one teaching in that situation and and it's really hard to teach people to do research yes <laughs> mm -hmm. It really uh, is very – it's a totally functionally independent repertoire than just doing research. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah, for this – because you spoke a lot in you know, the, the 2010 study about how much so many of these chains had to do with the nondescript – you had to have a play. You know, you had to be having fun with the kids. Did you find yeah. when you were supervising, did you have any – either any students or anyone helping you that just kind of didn't get that? It was just like, here's a volcano. Go, kid. You know, um, or did everyone still kind of – in the mood to, to play when they were doing these sessions? They were good to play. You know, one of the things I learned about myself is that I'm extremely comfortable being silly and playful <laughs> and not everybody is equally comfortable. So, you know, if you supervise students, you see varying levels and some are a bit serious. <laughs> um, and so you had to kind of just encourage. I don't want you to do something, you know, be someone that you're not, but um, it's like you're playing with a child, you know, be a little bit lively, big, you know, kind of <laughs> think of think of the pace, you know, stop in between scenes, play a little, mm -hmm. tickle, you know, it, it, kind of, you, you don't have to be, be precise when you're running research, but you don't have to be severe, yeah. you know, <laughs> you don't have to suck the fun out of it. And, and, and yeah, so we, we talked about having fun and they did a great job. They did a great job. And we saw so many instances of unprogrammed generalization during that study. It was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun. 
Yeah, what, what were some examples of generalization that you you weren't expecting, or that just was like, "This is exactly what I've been working for," and, and just yeah. So uh, okay, I remember one was a report from mom who came back to us excited. Guess what? Guess what? We went picking. Uh, we went. I think we went picking strawberries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and he said uh, they gave him a, a little bucket, and he said, "Mom, how do I pick strawberries?" Yeah. Uh-huh. Hey. Oh, hey. well, another one, a participant. I guess he was. I think he was done with the study. I think it was the final day and he was drawing a picture and then he started writing a two and then he said, how do you spell Dorothy? <laughs> Which was cute. I know. This was for Dorothy Lerman. Right. Uh-huh. Right I think he had a little, little crush. <laughs> oh, who wouldn't? I know. Oh, that's I, so cool. <laughs> Yeah, I actually I told that story. I presented this in, in a conference in Brazil and she was there and she was I think slightly embarrassed. I love doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but it was so cool because that's what you want, right? Mm-hmm. Are you are you you are you using this now in in the real world, in your real life? Because mm-hmm. that's really the only thing that matters. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, so I always tell people to that, uh, make sure that you're monitoring that they actually use the information. So the, I love, mm-hmm. for example, um, Anar Ingvarsson, and I and, uh, it's, I think it's Amory Carnet and Anar, and the, I don't know, please tell me, with the device, which is basically kind of manding for, for the tax. Like, what is that, essentially? Right. Mm-hmm. And they showed, like correct tax and mans and then what they showed is an increase in first man's information but those decreased after a while we saw an increase concurrently in the tax and that's what you should see right 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 because otherwise the information is not being used as information used. Mm-hmm. right that is exactly there's no utility and so then mm-hmm. that kind of makes me wonder about is the mo in place mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah. So were well, your were your procedures vastly different from baseline and training to your 2010 study? I tried to like do a comparison check. Not really. We yeah. use uh, coex. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. So for the how, again, I would let the again they have to contact the struggle. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So I let them good. kind of struggle and twist and stare and kind of sweat it out a little bit. Um, 10 seconds is a long time. Yeah. yeah they struggle. Yeah. Oh, you feel the struggle. It doesn't you seem know, and, like a long and watch time. Watch your kid, right? If, if, if there's like, if we go right to anger during that time, like maybe cut it off a little sooner. Right. Mm. Yeah. You know, sure. it'll, it'll yeah. like that. But they should contact that. Oh, wait, I don't know what to do. All right. So I'm trying and it's not working. Because that's what should influence. Like, well, how do you do this then? And so we did that in baseline, and if they manned it, of course, we would have provided information, and if they didn't, um, then... We took it away. We would just shut it down. <laughs> yeah, that's what we interspersed. Mm-hmm. Here we interspersed with just giving them the final, because we didn't want them to see us do the change. Right, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Want to know right. So you just let them watch <laughs> the exploding volcano. We would do something behind a, kind of away from their view. We would have someone playing with them and be like, look. It's like on a um, cooking show when someone's like making a casserole and then the real one comes out of the oven, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, I made this earlier. This already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and then during training, it would just simply, we use an echoic to just to say, say, how do I, you know, make a volcano? And he, he was a one trial learner for the volcano because mm-hmm. that wasn't a particularly complex chain for him. Right. So that's when we upped it with sawing a lady in half. <laughs> right. Uh, origami bear head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't even make those. Me neither. <laughs> They're really, it's, it's really cute. Those are some and great so the ideas. information I provided was just step-by-step information. Mm-hmm. I didn't do it for them. I told them what to do. Right. I, I really also love that you include these generalization probes. I like that you did assess whether the how do I came about in other situations. Yeah. And then I do like the how many too because you never know, right? Yeah, I, mean, I didn't think at all that they were going to no, pers- but whatever nice. say how many. But it, this was more the experimenter and right. kind of curious in terms of understanding um, how autocritic frames work. Mm-hmm. And just to see, like, uh, and it was really cool. And it happened, I think, with all the participants. I think for the other kid was, it was the change in the vending machine. And it was like, how many coins or how many quarters do I need? Yeah. And he said, uh, how do I get a, how do I make a snack or how do I get a snack? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And one thing I think 
I always like to think about too is the asking like how many, like assessing for that would look at how you could stretch the generality of what you're teaching, right? Because who knows, it could have come about, right? If they had like counting or whatever in their repertoire, it could have like stretched those limits of generality. You never know. I mean Yeah, I mean I think the many it would have surprised me if they oh, kind yeah. if they knew in a sense under what conditions to say right. yeah. many. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would have been like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. Actually, I would have been terrified because I thought, crap. Right, yeah. Where did that right. come from? <laughs> well, why? Damn it. Yeah, right. Um, now we have I, another I, study that we have to do. Rats foiled again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. So then, uh, and so then, uh, so brings us, we are, we're wrapping up a, a why study. I'm about to submit that sucker. That's, that's a hard, that's a tough one right there. I mean, I'm just thinking about. The M, you know, we're contriving an MO for why. It's like, oh, aren't you curious about stars? No, not really. <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know. Think about all the conditions under which you emit why. There are so many, mm -hmm. and they vary, um, I think, to a much greater extent yes. than the conditions under which you say where. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm right. trying to think about it right now. So, because sometimes, and think about when, you know, okay. kids first yeah, and why, I think it's just, you know, oftentimes a man for attention. Yep. Why? Yeah. Why? 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 <laughs> right? But then, well, at least it's partially attention maintained. Yeah. Yes. Which is fine. Well, it's, it's like the more advanced because, you know, if you just say mom or dad, you know, the parents have, have right. sort of tried to put that on extinction. But if they say Ooh. why, parents are like, oh, I better respond to it. You know, there's just some sort of. It's just a different yeah. social you know, It only bid. takes three why questions to get to a level of existential crisis. I don't think that's always <laughs> I think, it, I think I it's true. I think it's true. I think it's true. That's the Tootsie Pop number two. <laughs> that's, I was just thinking about that owl. Yeah. 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 One, How two, many why two, it's a total three. Get to an existential so, crisis. <laughs> I could, I, I'm trying. I obviously can't think of all the functions of why, but I could see how it could assist in problem solving in order to yeah. then access a reinforcer, so right? So we, yeah, there is, there are so many ways you can teach why. So one of the things I used to think about was, well, with the kids that we're teaching at their age, what are some common reasons uh, these kids at this age ask why? Mm -hmm. well, let's try with those. So we can try three different EOs for those. I don't want to get out my secrets. Yeah, no, you, don't okay. have to. you don't have, you don't to. have to. We'll, goes... just, we'll just wait. <laughs> Although we presented Faded it breath. in ABAI. So. Mm. <laughs> but still, it's, not, it's okay. It's not no. that secret. Oh, um, wait, I thought of one. Like when when you change change something that's supposed to happen, that's usually a go-to. Like adults don't ask that as much, but I think for kids, oh, it's yeah. like, oh, okay, like, you're going to you're gonna put this on instead. Wow. Or there's no, yeah, the kids oh, ask sure. why. Good job. That would be one. I just okay. thought, yeah, I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking, when do my kids whind why at me in a way that I'm like, I don't want to answer <laughs> sure. this question. So you need yeah. to restore order. Nice. That's actually order. kind of one of the EOs Predictability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. I'm not, I'm going to stop you though because I don't want I know, you to spoil it. We don't want to it. give away your secrets. We'll come, we'll have you come back for part two. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, ha we're, but I want to submit that and Anar Ingerson and I um, are loading up slowly because we're overwhelmed with work, but we're loading up uh, another M. Uh, Mansford information study right now. Cool, nice, cool, cool. Okay. Yeah. So I hopefully there'll that. be some fresh results in a year. Okay. Hopefully. All right. You know yeah. how it goes. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Slow, a year or two. Slow turn. <laughs> so we're to, that sounds like a good pause point to move into our dissemination station. Ooh. Oh, we're here! Hooray! We made it. I think one of the big takeaways I, I had from these these articles, Sarah, was less the sort of how would I teach man for information? Because the, the, the basic prompting was not itself very tricky. It was a, a lot more about the MOs. How am I going to set up the situations? And I know as someone who works with a lot of either new teachers or teachers who are sort of you know, in a classroom that's kind of based in behavior analysis, but they themselves might not be a BCBA – identifying MOs or explaining what is it you should be looking for can be very hard, even with like really, you know, the most basic of mans. So yeah. I love these examples of like, read all these examples. This is what <laughs> you're looking for. That, that's the, the struggle. Like, like you d described, mm -hmm. you're not going to teach this skill with a child who doesn't seem to care 
that they're missing right. an item. And if you assume that they're missing an item, like, oh, we can't take your test because your pencil's not here. Maybe that's not the best one to start. <laughs> no. <laughs> I love that. I'd be like, yes, I'm going home. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, li- I, I, did, I did love that. Just the idea of if you're going to teach – Manning for information, you have to be sure that there is a value. There is a value in getting that information. If you don't want the information, right. you're not going to man for it. Just like That's with right. a physical item. That's one, right. One indirect take home point that I had that I loved is that you use a cumulative record to answer your question yeah. because yeah. I think a lot of times people are scared of cumulative records uh, about using them and about looking them, especially students. But it's important to match your design with your question, right? So no other experimental design like in the in the graphical display would really show what you were looking for in that instance. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad yeah, you used it. I, I lo- I'm a fan Me of too. the cumulative record. I am too. Yeah. I call it the unicorn of experimental designs because they're so so rare to find one in the wild. <laughs> oh, is that right? I really mm-hmm. like them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're I unicorn. really do. You know, when it's useful, a way of examining uh, examining uh, the research question. Because I mean, I don't write if it's a yes no did they or didn't they. Then you get like you could get like a little Charlie Brown T-shirt pattern. Like that's not useful right, for examination. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you could look at like percentages of trials, but that could mean that you would have to yield per like data point like way too mm-hmm. many trials, right? And I don't really want to do that either, mm-hmm. especially when um, the mo <laughs> is so incredibly important. I don't right. need to be like we're going to power through ten trials. Right. Like it or no. Not. Like, oh, You're going to squash it. No, we're not. Like, it. like it or not, we're doing it. We're making this. <laughs> volcano <laughs> 10 times today right you have to preserve you have to preserve the mo absolutely yeah 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 so that's one thing i loved cool yeah now sarah had you cool. had you any either just in in any of your other work or, or have you had any colleagues who looked into some of the prerequisites skills needed for students because i know in your 2010 study you mentioned that perhaps some of the prerequisites aren't as stringent as you thought they might be for, you know, being yeah. able to teach students Manning for information. Are there sort of rules of, hey, teachers, if you're going to teach Manning for information, these are some of the skills you probably want to make sure that you've taught your student yeah. first or your students acquired first? Yeah, there are some um, that I give, um, especially when I present on Manning for information. Um, one, they do have to have um, a, a pretty robust Manning for items repertoire. Um, it is inappropriate to target mans for information with someone who just barely man for items. Mm-hmm. They have to be able to tact all the items that you are using in your chains or your activities mm-hmm. as well, because they will be tacting, partially tacting when they're manning for information. Mm-hmm. Okay. They have to follow, I say, at least one step directions, because I'm going to tell you to do something or go somewhere, or grab something or look for something or pick up something, right? You need to be able to follow those directions, mm-hmm. right, for, to, for it to be meaningful. Um, and so those are some of the basics that I, that I tell folks. I need to be able to do those things. Yeah, that makes sense. And then mm-hmm. you as the teacher in this scenario need to find something that's going to be reinforcing and motivating oh, yeah. all the and way then- through to the end. Yeah, and so then, then comes um, and and I think and I think you're right, Rob. I think one of the hardest parts is sort of all the work on the front end to make yeah. sure that you have everything needed and ready to go. I personally quite find it kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Like I, I kind of like doing it, but you know, I could see like the teachers tired. They have a lot of kids. <laughs> you know, they have a lot of things to focus on. It can, can feel exhausting, but I also think that you can do it in the context of everyday activities Mm -hmm. it's like well give them you know give them the bowl of cereal without the spoon Mm -hmm. right and when they look at you just just be like you know just say where's the spoon where's the spoon oh it's in the drawer and then shut it down i'm just kidding (laughs) (laughs) right you know so you you can you can and you can start peppering it into everyday activities Mm -hmm. Um, there's lots of opportunities to create um mo's yeah and even in like a preschool classroom you know i mean for, for Again, depending on your learner, yeah. you have little kids who are often pretty damn rigid with all the little systems you build. Like we put your name over here when you come into school and you yeah. hang your backpack on the hook over here and you get the crayons mm-hmm. and you put them over here. I mean, you've got 
so many yeah. things you could totally screw up that would mo- yeah. <laughs> to make motivation for where, where's the name tag where's the crayon box That's where it. the dolls go where the mm-hmm. you know, i mean and then for every kid you oh. find what are they playing with and oh i'm yeah. hiding all that stuff and it's all in the wrong yeah. spot you can do that at your house too my daughter mm. has like a weird compulsion to put everything away in certain bins. A weird oh, compulsion? Nice. I mean, ride that Ooh, one as long as you got it. You. <laughs> yeah. No, but she's like, put away, put the spoons away in the blue bin. Oh, and man. so Ooh. I could just hide the blue bin and then she hide the blue know what bin. to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, I think when I, when, you know, to, when consulting with folks, um, the one of the things is just teaching them how to, how to contrive the MO, just giving them ideas. Yeah, that's it's not in- yes. intuitive. It is to us, but it really isn't to others. Yeah, you know? yeah, you're so just right. kind of helping get the wheels turning and the juice flowing, and like, oh, you know, here's how you can do it in your regular day. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Mm-hmm. Ah, so manning for information is something that everyone can do. It just takes a little that's bit. Right creativity and, and forethought and outside of yeah. the boxness and outside of the boxness where's the box <laughs> who has the box how many boxes how do i go outside the box <laughs> 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 oh. all right so let's make sure that the audience is still if they didn't don't want to demand for information from us about that second secret code word which is sherpa s-h-e-r-p-a Apparently, Diana went on a mountain <laughs> trek and forgot to tell me. You know what? I chose this because I feel like Sarah was our VB Sherpa oh. through this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Wow. Okay. So, Sherpa. There we go. Okay. <laughs> that's going on the business card. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah you go. Well, actually, that's VB not a bad Sherpa. thing. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to the end of another fabulous episode of ABA Inside Track. We think it's fabulous. <laughs> I mean, I get not, not to toot our Rob. own horn. I don't know. I feel I feel very full of ourselves, full of myself right now. Sorry about that. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed the show. ABA Inside Track comes out every week. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe and leave us a little review. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can also find us everywhere on social media, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, as ABA Inside Track. We have our website, abainsidetrack.com, where you can find the episodes posted and uh, purchase CEs if you would so desire. And you can also email us anytime at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. Well, Sarah, thank you so very, very much for coming on the show and talking to us all about this awesome topic. We haven't done... Well, thanks for inviting. Oh, it was was great. It was great. We haven't done mans in a long time, so it was really nice to get kind of a more robust and and less uh, discussed man form, I think. It was very fun. So thank you. And again, thank you, Jackie and Diana. You guys were here as well. We have really appreciated... (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. (laughs) All right, we'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. Bye.